We're going to go over here and, and have a chat. Because you can take that one, I'll take this one. Um, I think we were going to start with uh, a little bit of discussion of the curiosity of space and, and, and you know, being out there and seeing that. But I think given the events that have occurred uh, in the earlier part of this week, uh, the audience is most likely curious uh, about your reaction. You, you were in the same situation as uh, the families and the victims of the Navy Yard shooting in Washington. Um, you've been in that situation. Um, what was your first response when you heard this news? Well, first of all, let me first welcome everybody to Gabby's home state and now mine of Arizona. Uh, Gabby's a third generation Tucsonan, which is about two hours uh, down the road from here. And we're very excited that this uh, conference is, is here in Arizona, so welcome. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to be able to say that I was shocked. Unfortunately, I've spent so much time focusing on this issue and are well aware of how often that we do have mass shootings. Uh, that I wasn't surprised that we had another one, to be honest. You know, it's, uh, we, are, we are about nine months, maybe 10 months, since 20 first graders were murder, murdered in their classrooms in Newtown, Connecticut. And the national response so far to that tragedy has been to do nothing. And with any problem, as many of you in this audience know, if there's a problem and we don't make change and we don't look for solutions, the problem isn't just going to go away. So I was not, I was not surprised. I was just, it's just a matter of time of when is it going to be the next one. You started an organization to try to affect change on this issue um, uh, after the incident uh, here. What have been your successes and what are your frustrations? So Gabby and I started an organization back in January after, the, after Newtown uh, called Americans for Responsible Solutions. And it's an organization that consists of a 501c4 and a super PAC. And if you would have asked Gabby or I two years ago or told us that we would be running a super PAC, I'd say you're crazy. To be honest, I'm not the biggest fan you know, of that political entity. But the reality of life today is if you want to take on a very powerful gun lobby, which is incredibly influential because of the influence that the NRA has in Washington, you got to kind of take them on on their own terms. And for the last 30 years, the National Rifle Association has spent an enormous amount of money in Washington on House and Senate races. So we looked at what the problem is, and it basically boils down to this, that the gun lobby spends about $20 million a year, which to some of you does not seem like a lot of money, but they spend $20 million a year focusing on gun rights and supporting House and Senate candidates in their federal elections, about $20 million. And all of the organizations on the other side of the issue typically spend combined $20,000. So it's out of balance. Small to count. Completely out of balance. So we formed an organization to try to bring some balance to this debate in Washington. And, you know, we've been around 10 months and we've, you know, raised about $14 million. We have a goal to raise about 35 before the 2014 elections. And over time, we will, our hope is to get members of Congress to vote with their conscience on this issue and not based on the influence of any organization, including ours. I know this is a difficult subject, but I want, I mean, you've, we talked uh, previously and, and you told the story of, of what happened when, and where you were when, when, you know, you were in the same situation as the folks yesterday um, were. You were in Houston, as I recall, is that correct? I was in Houston the, the day Gabby was injured uh, at home with my kids. Gabby was in Tucson in her district, and I got a call from the woman who's now our executive director that's sitting next to Gabby. Pia Carasone, the executive, executive director of our organization, was Gabby's chief of staff. And she called me up and she just said, I don't, I don't know how to tell you this, but Gabby's been shot. She didn't have much more info. Uh, I got off the phone with her. Five minutes later, I thought to myself, did I just imagine that this happened? And I literally had to go walk up to my phone, pick it up off the table, and say, OK, I did get that incoming call. 
And then I called Pia back, and then that's when she gave me the really devastating news that Gabby had been shot in the head. And my kids and I and my mom got on a friend's airplane, and we flew west towards Tucson. During that flight, it was pretty chaotic. We were watching TV, and at one point, MSNBC, Fox, CNN, all pronounced Gabby dead, right. which they shouldn't do. We got any doctors in the audience? <laughs> we should leave that, we should leave you mean that journalists to shouldn't be pronouncing people dead? Journalists shouldn't do that, especially only on the one source. <laughs> you know, that was not a good idea. We're, uh, one of the great stories that came out of this is um, how Gabby responded. Um, I, were you surprised, and what did you learn from that process? Well, Gabby's tough, really, really tough. I mean, she takes on, you know, issues like nobody I've ever seen. When she was in Congress, you know, she was a bipartisan legislator. You know, Gabby in her second term in Congress was the person in the middle. The National Journal, I think, ranks members from all the way on the right to all the way on the left. And Gabby was a person in the middle in her second, second term. So she's tried to always tackle issues in a uh, bipartisan fashion. And that, you know, that's what we're doing on this issue. We're trying to engage members of Congress. We, you know, we recently worked on this Manchin-Toomey bill, which failed in the Senate, but we made progress. The United States Senator from Arizona, John McCain, voted for it. That's a step in the right direction. I think over time, we will convince more legislators uh, and also folks at the state level that we have to do something about this problem. I don't think ever people realize this, but we have 15 to 20 times the death rate from gun violence than any other industrialized country. 15 times is the best that we can do over the next worst industrial country. I was talking to a gentleman that uh, had arranged the, the Google meetup with the Free Syrian Army Major, and I asked him, I said, how many people have died there in the last couple of years, he said 110,000. You know how many people have died in the United States from gun violence in the last two years? Almost that many, probably about 80,000, and we're not at war. It's extraordinary. I, I want to pivot if we can, because I think we'll come back to this subject, but, but ask you, uh, because the theme throughout the conference and throughout this session um, has to do with wonder and curiosity. You have been where very few uh, of us have been. Um, you have seen uh, the Earth through the capsule of a, of a ship orbiting it. Um, what's that like? Well, flying in space is an incredible privilege. I mean, I, I am very thankful that I had the opportunity to do that, not once, but four times. Um, and I, you know, I really treasure every day I got to spend in space. My, my, the part I like the most is the rocket launch. I mean, you can't... <laughs> the G-forces? Well, it's not the G-forces. It's, it's the matter that you, you, you climb into this rocket ship about three hours before liftoff. You're laying on your back. You got all this stuff you got to turn on. Countdown clocks heading towards zero. Six seconds, the main engines start. You don't go anywhere because you're literally bolted to the launch pad. Then the clock hits zero. Those bolts explode. Solid rocket boosters light. It's literally like the hand of God coming down and ripping you off the planet. Incredible amount of vibration. You accelerate from zero to 17,500 miles an hour in just eight and a half minutes. Two minutes into the flight, you guys have seen this, the solids come off, they go in the ocean. NASA goes and picks those up, reuses them. I think they're only slightly more expensive to reuse. <laughs> and then we continue to go uphill at the end of that eight and a half minutes, the tank comes off and you're whipping around the planet every, every 90 minutes. And it's amazing to see this big blue marble just floating in the blackness of space. No strings attached, you know, just as a globe. It's just an, an incredible experience. Hope to get to do it again sometime. I imagine everyone here would like to do it too. <laughs> <laughs> um, especially after that description. Uh, uh, did seeing that, I mean, there's a famous image from the whole Earth catalog of, of, the, of the Earth that, that sort of sparked a movement, I think, and made us all realize that we needed to maybe start taking more drugs. Um, 
I did not mean to ask that question, but did it change your perspective about the world in a way that was meaningful? I mean, the thing it did for me, and I think everybody's experience is a little bit different, but I noticed on my first flight, first day, you know, we're up at about 250 miles maybe, looking down at the planet, and you look at the edge, you know, the, the Terminator, you know, the edge of the horizon, and you see this little sliver there, and I remember mentioning it to my commander on my first flight. I said, hey, you see that little sliver there? And he, he says, yeah, that's the atmosphere. And from that perspective, when you consider, when you look at it from, from Earth orbit, and you see this little tiny haze, and that's, that's our atmosphere, it makes you uh, understand that it needs to be protected. Um, Half of our atmosphere is 10,000 feet and below. That's half of it. You know, the other half goes, continues to go up, but by, you know, molecules, half of it is below 10,000 feet. It's not, very, it's not very thick, and we need to be aware of that. Yeah, I imagine that does give you some perspective. Uh, what's going on with the space program now? I mean, uh, it's, I, I think the idea of children growing up thinking they might we, we may have missed a generation of kids who thought that that was something they might do. Do you think that the next generation might have that dream again? I think they will. We, you know, part of our problem with our space program is we often start and stop programs, maybe not for the best of reasons. In my 16 years at NASA, I've seen the administration in the White House cancel programs. I've seen Congress and NASA itself cancel things that if we, if, if, if we maintain the focus and we worked really hard, we can solve these problems. I think we can solve anything. I think, you know, I'm, we have the best engineers in the world. We can solve very difficult problems, but we often give up and we shouldn't. And it always frustrated me when NASA decided to end a program and continue in a different direction. So my hope now is uh, we're on this path currently with a program called Commercial Crew, which are these smaller companies, a company like SpaceX or Sierra Nevada, for instance, uh, and others, Blue Origins, that are going to try to transport crew members to the International Space Station. And for full disclosure, I do some consulting with SpaceX, but from my experience there, they'll be able to figure this out. And at some point, they're going to be flying people in space on SpaceX spacecraft. It's just a matter of the United States government and NASA maintaining that focus and decide not to do something else. Now, if you ask me when we're going to go to Mars with people, I have no idea. There's a fellow coming up later who can address that. I mean, we could send somebody to Mars right now. Problem is, we can't get them back. <laughs> so that's the hard part. That's well, the I mean, trick. When you're strapped to a, a rocket, about to be catapulted or, I suppose, lifted by the hand of God, don't you sort of figure that you might not be coming back? You recognize that there is a real probability that that's going to be your last day, especially on liftoff and on landing. Oddly enough, statistically, our most dangerous, calculated most dangerous time in, is the time we spend in space from getting hit by a big rock or even a little rock that puts a big hole in the spacecraft. But you, you know, you're aware of that. We spend a lot of time training for these missions. The space shuttle, as, you know, as a point of reference, is very crew intensive. And there's a lot we can do when things go wrong to fix the problem. But then there's all this other stuff that we can't do anything about and can be catastrophic. And those things we don't, you just hope they don't happen, you don't worry about them too much. Well, I think this is a, a good transition in terms of the idea that you thought it might be your last day. Um, you went through that experience uh, with your wife. So I'd like you to uh, introduce her, if you could. So Gabby, like I mentioned earlier, Gabby and I have been working on this issue of gun violence for about uh, 10 months now, or nine months, with our organization called Americans for Responsible Solutions. We've been traveling around the country. We recently hit seven states in seven days trying to get legislators to focus on the problem. And we, we, we have some focus, and we have good people in Congress that want to do something. But, you know, the, the issue is 
you know, unfortunately, the influence of, of, uh, of the gun lobby. And the NRA, in particular, has done a tremendous job. You've got to give them a lot of credit. They have worked that issue to their benefit very well. But it's going to be our job to create an effective counterbalance to that. And I am inspired each and every day by, you know, the approach that my wife has taken, that she's willing to get out there despite having been almost killed by gun violence herself. Her career ended, but she's motivated to do this. Uh, you know, Gabby Giffords reminds me each and every day to deny the acceptance of failure. You know, often when she gets in that car before going off to therapy each day, one of the last things she'll say is fight, fight, fight. She does not give up, and she's really committed to this. So I'd like to introduce you to my beautiful wife, Gabby Giffords. So from Gabby's injury, she suffers from a condition called aphasia, which is a difficulty with communication. So we were working on, on this statement at the breakfast table the other day. I recently had, uh, well, a while back, I had some surgery on my right elbow. I ripped the bicep tendon off the bone pole vaulting. Don't ask me why at my age I was pole vaulting, but I was. And I was complaining to Gabby. She was eating her yogurt. We were working on this. She was complaining. I was complaining about how my arm hurt. She, and she looked up from her yogurt and with just the raise of her eyebrows said to me, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> so Gabby Giffords. Thank you for inviting us here today. Um, Stop thank, thank, thank you. Stop it. I mean, Stopping gun violence takes courage. The courage to do what's right. The courage of new ideas. I've seen great courage when my life was on the line. Now is the time to come together. Be responsible. Democrats, Republicans, everyone. We must never stop fighting. Fight, fight, fight. Fight, be bold, be courageous. The nation is counting on you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.